Star, a Sailor Moon podcast. I'm your host, Alex Summers, and today we are covering the episode titled Cruise Blues from the VHS tape Sailor Mars Joins the Battle. First up will be an article we found interesting from this past week regarding Sailor Moon. Next will be Chris Mayick and I's discussion of the episode, and I say it that way because I've been mispronouncing it the whole time. And finally, we'll wrap up We'll wrap up with the official episode information and a brief one-on-one with me, Alex. I'll see you in the outro. Peace. In Sailor Moon News, this was published five days ago um, on The Escapist. And the title of the article I want to read to you before we get into the episode is called Where the Heck Are the Sailor Moon Games? And I just love the title, first of all. It's by a man named John Frischka. And I have been asking this question ever since I got into the genre. I mean, the world of Sailor Moon itself lends itself to all types of video games so naturally that it just doesn't make sense that we haven't had big brands take more investment in this. I don't know why. So let's get into the article. I'm just going to read it verbatim. If you want to, you can go find it online. But I thought this is probably an easier way for you guys to get the information. The Sailor Moon franchise has generated well beyond $13 billion in merchandising revenue alone. It is one of the most iconic and recognizable manga or anime IP to ever leave Japan. It is the rare property that caters to both men and women across a wide age range. Its enduring popularity since the 1990s resulted in a new Toei animation, Sailor Moon Crystal, which received a two-part movie just last year. So it all begs the question, where the heck are the Sailor Moon games? There was briefly a Mach 3 mobile game that publisher Bandai, 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 Namco, Namco, Bandai, Namco, I don't know the pro... Anyway, ultimately shut down. But beyond that, it's been years since there's been a Sailor Moon game of any note. This complete absence of Sailor Moon games is nothing short of baffling, especially compared to how many video games other popular animes are receiving. Just look at Dragon Ball, the other iconic anime that exploded in international popularity in the 1990s. Since 2015 alone, the franchise has launched Dragon Ball Xenoverse, Dragon Ball Xenoverse 2, Dragon Ball Fighter Z. Super Dragon Ball Heroes World Mission, Dragon Ball Z Kakarot, Kakarot, and Dragon Ball The Breakers. That includes a traditional fighting game, two 3D games, an action RPG, a complete terrible (laughs) card game, (laughs) and a widely underrated asymmetrical survival game. That's a pretty wide library, so if you're into Dragon Ball Z and you didn't know, yay for you. I mean, I, I like it, but not that much. Um, Granted, it's well established that anime always seem to get the fighting game adaptations, whether anybody wants them or not, but remove the fighting games from the equation and Dragon Ball is still offering a diverse lineup of games. Likewise, One Piece has a whole series of Musou games, I think that's how you say that, Musou, Musou games, in addition to a highly anticipated upcoming RPG. Regardless, the point is that massive, active anime franchises typically have no trouble getting video game adaptations into development. It makes the case of Sailor Moon into an even bigger mystery. And then they have some screenshots from Sailor Moon Another Story, which is the only RPG we ever got. It's fabulous. Go play it. It seems unlikely that Sailor Moon creator, Naoko Takeuchi, has a personal aversion to video games, since Sailor Moon games existed in abundance in Japan in the 90s. And an arcade also featured prominently in the story. Oh, that's re- they're referencing the arcade where the girls play, okay. There were fighting games, brawlers, puzzlers, and even a full-blown RPG, which would eventually get a fan translation. Rather, it seems the present lack of Sailor Moon games comes down to corporate apathy. Theodore Jefferson once laid out a depressing case for why Toei just may not care about making Sailor Moon games. 
Indeed, even Bandai and Namco only gave a vague explanation back in 2015 about why there are no games offering. It really comes down to us being able to develop a compelling game that treats the Sailor Moon franchise the right way, and we'd want to know that the fans would support the game. That means they want to know they're going to make money. In other words, the game would have to be a good or be good, a stipulation that has never stopped most anime games from existing, fair, and the financial demand for it would have to be clear. However, it's difficult for the fandom to express enthusiasm for something that never exists, short of starting a petition and probably writing it in English and Japanese for good measure. It's especially frustrating because the Sailor Moon IP lends itself abnormally well to almost every genre of game. I had not read the article before I started reading this out loud and before I gave my opinion at the beginning, so I'm glad we're on the same wavelength here. Um, It can be a cutesy puzzle game. It can be a Mega Man-esque platform or side-scroller. It can be a rhythm game with all of its memorable music. It can be a rather sophisticated dating sim. It can be a straight-up school-life sim like Persona 5, but with all the combat taken out. It can be a full-on story-intensive RPG like Persona 5 with the combat put back in again. In most grandiose AAA scenario, Sailor Moon could become a co-op open-world action-adventure set across a stylized Tokyo draped in the mesmerizing pastel color palettes of the 90s anime. A project with this type of budget isn't likely to see the light of day anytime soon, but it should probably be one of the end goals for the fandom. It's worth noting that Saban actually pitched a game almost exactly like this for the Power Rangers IP back in 2016, but it never progressed beyond the exploration phase due to the budget it would have required and due to other projects taking up resources. However, one could argue that Sailor Moon attracts a broader demographic than Power Rangers, although both franchises have inspired imitators as video games. So, what can fans do if they want new Sailor Moon video games? Firstly, they have to be outspoken, politely suggesting the idea in relevant social media channels and at conventions. Secondly, I don't know why I said it that way, conventions. Secondly, they have to be realistic. Don't demand a game the size of Grand Theft Auto. If the horror of horrors Bandai Namco digs up another mobile game as the next Sailor Moon project, you should probably just play the thing and offer polite feedback accordingly. Likewise, try to financially support anything that might be video game adjacent, like if Sailor Moon cosmetics appear in another game you play. Got it. If corporate apathy really is the reason why there are no Sailor Moon games, then the impetus is on fans internationally to let Japan know that they are ready and eager to spend money on such games, presuming they're good games, of course. The alternative is that things simply continue as they have, with the likes of Toei and Bandai Namco leaving money on the table, and fans continuing to have to use the create a character feature in other games to pretend that they're Sailor Jupiter or Tuxedo Mask. And that's the end of the article. I agree with almost everything in it. I I think the person was just thinking out loud when they made the suggestions for different types of games. Sailor Moon does fit most genres particularly well. I don't think it needs to be an open world MMO type game. Not everything has to go that route. Uh, And I I, I don't know. It just doesn't seem to me like it fits that specifically. Although I could see other online avenues for sure. But I I do think they're right. It's going to be up to the fans to convince them, whoever they are, the powers that be, that we want it and that we're going to buy it. And they're right, it is hard to do that because most, even though there were a lot of games in the 90s, most of them, I don't think any of them were translated officially into English. So there was no way for, there's no market like history in that way for them to gauge what will happen if they were to do that. And there was that DS game that came out, but that only got translated into Italian. They never localized it to the United States or North America generally. So 
just to, I thought this article was interesting because it's a point that I naturally bring up a lot, and I think a lot of other fans agree with. I think Sailor Moon is perfect for the gaming industry. I don't know why. Almost every other anime has a bajillion games that are, as this article pointed out, not all gems. And with Sailor Moon, we're we're given like nothing. I don't know what that is. Although we're in a renaissance for the series right now, so it's kind of a great time to push for something like this. Let's see, maybe there's something we can do about it. So I did a little digging and it does seem like there was a petition seven years ago that got some likes and some attention, but it didn't get very far, or not some likes, some signatures. But that was before the internet of today and before TikTok and everything. So who knows? Let's throw this into the universe. We want Sailor Moon video games. Let's be specific. Personally, I think it fits the RPG RPG genre the best. We've gotten already a bunch of fighters. If they want to do that again, fine. But let's go for something with more substance, right? And if we're going to be specific, um, I say we ask for something in the style of like Octopath Traveler. So 8-bit mixed with modern graphics and stuff like that. I think if they that would give them the most freedom with the smallest amount of budget to give us the best quality. Because they would be able to pump a lot of story into it, get some really good graphics down for the battles that wouldn't cost a ton to make but would be great and easy to replicate animations from the show already and yeah i just think that's the perfect avenue so that's what i'm putting out into the universe give us an sailor moon rpg in the style of octopath traveler that would be amazing if you ask me if you have a specific sailor moon video game wish go ahead and submit it to us you know where to send it sunshinefarmentertainment at gmail.com Moonstar, a Sailor Moon podcast will return in a moment Get ready to be punished in the name of the moon That means you! We gotta bust the bad guys! Yeah. Every weekday at 4, Sailor Moon and the Scouts take girl power to a whole new level you Sailor Moon, weekdays at 4 We are the champions of justice! It was supposed to be a dream vacation on the coolest cruise ship. But it turns into a really bad trip when the evil servants of the Negaverse show up. Sailor Scouts, we'll be right back. So stick around. So did you watch uh, Cruise Blues yet this week or recently? Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on it? Because I just did my watch through like before I called or did the Zoom. So um, I actually really liked the monster in that episode. And I liked just the whole, the whole theme of it. And obviously it's one of the episodes that has better animation and character design. So that also really helps. But yeah, I, I've always... Thetis was one of the cooler monsters in season one, in my opinion. I actually... Um, I touched on that a little too when I was watching through it because something about her that I thought was so unique in this this version of the dub is that Queen Beryl was mad that she died because she was strong. I don't know why you've bothered returning. You failed miserably and cost me a great ally in Titus Jedi. It's those Sailor Scouts. And that's one of the, and it is, it is the last episode before we lose Jedi, you know? And it, I think that is kind of interesting because she's never cared before. Right. And then she also kind of had her own unique personality in a way that we didn't get much of with the other ones. <laughs> Jedi, you must be losing your touch letting that silly little satyr rat bother you. What brings you here, Titus? I've been monitoring your progress and I gotta say, you look like you need some help. Crawl back under the rock you came from, Titus. I don't need your help. I'm doing just fine by myself. 
You're as stubborn as ever, but I want a chance to prove myself. Give me a chance to help Green Barrel with a great mission. Also, she seemed very strong in like mm -hmm. with the water attacks and stuff. The one thing I think this episode could have done, because I did the uh, Dream Dollies watch through right before it. I think the battle in Dream Dollies was better because it was a little bit longer. It was way more nuanced. And I felt like for that Yoma to just be a random one to get that treatment where then Titus felt a little short and kind of slapped together with the battle. I was like, I wish they would have put like reflipped it and like made the Dream Dollies episode a little bit less and put more into this one just so that it felt like Titus's battle scene matched her, I guess, ranking in the Negaverse. You know what I mean? Because she was probably the strongest Yomo. I, it makes sense we get before we switch over to Netflight. Because I don't mm -hmm. think he uses, he might use like the, the like clay golem people things, but I don't think he does any Yoma in the next one. Yeah. What else did you think about this episode? Um, I like how they get really close to figuring out who Jedi is before he uh, gets sucked back to the megaverse. Yeah. They do. I like that part when they were kind of like playing investigation a little bit because I forget sometimes that they don't know what's going on yet, even though we do. And something else that stood out to me was there's a lot of character development in both of the, the two episodes that I watched today. And I, that is what is missing from some of the other iterations of it, I think, because, you know, seeing Ray and Serena kind of bickering a little bit and the, how their relationship sort of starts in that way and develops into like a more mature sort of rivalry friendship later, like, that's not in the first season of Crystal at all. I think that's, for me, I haven't watched past, I, I watched some of season two of Crystal, and I know it's supposed to get better, but the first season was so, like, it was, like, dry. I don't know. I've never been less interested in Sailor Moon in my life <laughs> than when I watched season one of Crystal. I know this is not about that, but have you seen Crystal? Uh. Yeah, I mean, I've seen, like, important parts of it. I'm not really into it either, but that's... I mean, I, I couldn't get into that character design at all. They're so thin mm -hmm. and so long. And, like, in the transformation sequences and stuff, like, they had this weird combo of, like, 3D and animated that didn't hit well. And then yep. their arms looked like spaghetti when they were moving around. And it's just, like... They in the I never I thought they were thin in the '90s one, you know, and tall. And then I saw that, and I was like, oh. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, okay, we have the same. I'm gonna force myself to watch eventually, but only after I like exhaust all the other content, <laughs> and then I'll be like, yeah. fine, it's time. And then <laughs> whatever, maybe I'll like it. But we get a lot of Katie Griffin, and this episode is there anything you remember from interviewing her that kind of stuck out as interesting or fun uh yeah there were several things that um that she one of them i think you mentioned before or it wasn't specifically mentioned but it, um it was in the same vein that when they first when in season one when her and karen bernstein um got the roles of Ami and Ray that their voices sounded too similar to each other so the the director um made a point of them a, a couple times being in the same uh recording session together and then uh setting that apart and making sure that they do something to their voice that's nuanced enough but still recognizable that uh separates how they sound and then is that uh, why Amy has such a specific sound I would think so, yeah. And that is one of my favorite parts of the dub is the way she sounds because it's like such, it's, people don't typically talk like that. So it's so stuck to that character in my head. You know what I mean? So have you noticed? We're the only ones without dates. Where are all the guys? I don't know, but that doesn't mean we can't have fun. I mean, having a date would be great, but being with you is cool too. <laughs> Good, I agree completely. And then with Katie Griffin, 
I don't know what it is about how she does the voice for Mars, but when I hear other anime that has like female characters in it, I'm like, yes, that is a human woman doing that voice. And with her, she, there's like a certain effect to that. I think like she was putting on something that gave it that unique distinction too, even though it's not like, cause with Amy, it's more obvious cause there's kind of like part, like an accent, I guess, a little that you can detect there. Yeah. But then with uh, Mars, I think it's the cadence she used when she delivered the lines. I think it was like the intonation and the way when she spoke, she had a very specific sort of like, you can, it always goes a certain way that really stuck to that character. I think that might be what it is that made her sound so, like when you hear that voice, my head goes Sailor Mars right away. When when uh, Katie moved to, she moved to LA briefly, or she, I don't know if she actually lived there, but she was in LA for a while to pursue on camera there um, in the middle of our Emily Claire Barlow, um, took over Ray and then Katie came back and then um, Katie played Ray f- for S and Super S obviously. And then Emily, Emily Claire Barlow took over Venus when Stephanie Morgan Stern left. Okay. That's what it was. I know there was a point where Mars voice changed for a while, but I also think the person who did it was like trying to sound like Katie Griffin. So it's hard yeah. to tell. You know what I mean? And I think they did a good job trying to imitate her. Do you know what episodes those were by any chance? I know that's a specific. Yeah, it was like, it started in the middle. It started in the middle of R and like throughout most of R. Then, yeah, Katie was back in time to do all of S and all of Super S. Interesting. Also, well, before I forget, I was looking at this tape and something that I never noticed before, but like, do you see this tiny thing? Yeah. yeah. What the fuck is that? That doesn't exist. <laughs> I know. It's like they combined, they just like took Super Sailor Moon, turned her hair pink, and gave her like chunky short legs. Like she's like half chibi, half not. It's so weird. I love it. I like, wish it was a real character. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that stuck out to me because that was the one thing where I was like, that's they just made that up for this box (laughs) like that doesn't exist (laughs) um also i was fun just about the season one vhs they fucking have volume numbers on them and i was today years old when i figured that out and i've had these my whole life so Now for the official episode details. Cruised Blues is the ninth episode of Sailor Moon to air in North America, airing first on September 11th, 1995 in Canada, and September 21st, 1995 in the United States. In this episode, Jedi is approached by Titus at the beginning. They don't really get along with each other. She sort sort of bullies him a little, I guess you could say, or is taunting him. And also she says she wants a chance to prove herself to Queen Beryl. So that's why we've got this stronger monster coming along on this mission this time. Then we cut to Serena, who wants to go on a cruise, which is being advertised, and there's... Uh, a contest in town that you can win to get two free tickets. Ray ends up using her psychic powers to get the gold marble, which is how you win. And of course, Serena asks Ray to take her, but Ray is like, no. Uh, Because she, honestly, it's like her way to poke at her a little bit. She's, She's being a little bit, you know. And she decides to bring Amy instead. Serena uses the disguise power to transform into a photographer and sneaks on the ship, which is actually an illusion created by Jedi and Titus. Amy and Ray notice that they're the only ones there without dates, which they think is a little bit weird, but they decide to have fun anyway with each other. And Serena runs into Jedi and almost falls in love with him, and he nearly falls in love with her, or at least that's what this wiki says. Uh... Later, Serena and Luna spy on Jedi and Titus and discover that they are from the Negaverse. They're using a disco ball to steal energy from everyone, 
which I thought was pretty cool. The disco ball was animated in a neat way. And the idea of people in a ballroom where like anywhere the disco light was touching, it would take their energy and, and hold it in there. I thought that was kind of neat. Um, but they are using that to drain energy from those in love. So Amy and Ray don't get drained since they're the only ones there without dates. Jedi and Titus reveal their true forms and they crew. Oh, the crew members turn out to be gel monsters working for Titus. Sailor Mercury and Sailor Mars take care of the crew members before joining Sailor Moon to ultimately defeat Titus. But before Jedi can get away, the Sailor Scouts demand to know who he is, who he works for, and why he steals energy. But he returns to the Negaverse before they can get any answers. Back in the Negaverse, Beryl chastises him for his failure and for the death of Titus, who was a strong member of her team and plans to punish him for it. Meanwhile, the ship returns to its original form as the ruins of a ship, and another boat, presumably from the Japan Coast Guard, comes to pick up everyone, and they have regained their energy. I'll just do a little chat, like one-on-one, -on -one with you guys about some points Chris and I don't touch on in our discussion. But the state of the ship, when it, like, when it goes, the state of the ship when the illusion wears off is honestly disgusting. I mean, and the people are just kind of standing around on it, like, more chill than I feel like I would be realizing that that's the ship I was actually on. But mostly because I'd be afraid that it was going to sink. Because it looked like it was like a sneeze away from sinking. Like, it's that awful. Uh, <laughs> also... This is one of those episodes that was more about character building than action, which is fine. I was always someone who was into the show because I loved the action scenes as a kid. But as an adult, it's easier to appreciate episodes like this more because we get to see the nuances in the different relationships between the girls. Like how Amy and Ray's friendship develops. They don't really have any other one-on-one -on -one interaction, I think. Not much up until this point. So it was probably written this way for a reason, to give us an insight into how their relationship is, which is fairly sweet, honestly. I like them as a, as a friend duo. And then we also have the chance for Serena to be sort of the third wheel and have to come along anyway to protect her friends in the end. Even though, of course, she was going along for, a, I guess you could say, selfish reasons. But she is one of those characters, and there are people like this in real life too, where they're always sort of in the right place at the right time. And it's not always necessarily their intention to be there, but they just so somehow are. And... I think that she personifies that in this episode pretty great. So overall, it's a fun episode. It's a good watch. And I hope you guys enjoyed listening to the discussion and the the, the recap of it. If, if you have any specific memories about any episodes at all, even if we've already covered it, I want you to go ahead and send those in as either a video or an audio recording to Sunshine Farm Entertainment at gmail.com the only real requirement is that so you must be 18 or older to send a submission but those are going to start being included on the show as soon as we start getting uh ones that we can use and that are relevant and that's going to be a section at the end i'm like i don't know we'll figure that part out later but we want to hear from you guys i want this to be a fan interactive podcast as much as we can that's it for the show this week. We hope you enjoyed reliving Cruise Blues with us. If you're watching along with us, I hope you're having fun with it because it's definitely been a really great time all around here. And feel free to support us. Follow us on social media. We are Sunshine Farm Entertainment on Instagram, YouTube, I believe there might be one on Facebook. There's a Moonstar. 
a Sailor Moon Podcast official Facebook page you can like now. And I, Alex Summers, am on TikTok. (laughs) I broke down. If you can't beat him, join. I resisted for a long time, but honestly, music, fun, filters, like what's not to like, right? So if you want to follow me there, Alex Summers, S-F-E is my TikTok. Make sure you're subscribed to Chris Mayick's YouTube channel to see all of the fun interviews he does there. C-H-R-I-S-M-A-Y-E-K. And same name, Chris Mayick, on Instagram for him. But most importantly, leave us a five-star review. Make sure you're subscribed to the podcast. Share it with a friend. And we'll see you in the next one. Peace. Take that, sailor girl! <laughs> A beautiful sight! Mars, fire ignite! Should we go after Jedite? Yes, but not yet! First, we've gotta help Sailor Moon! That monster's too strong! <laughs> There's no escape for you, Sailor Moon! Love you.